So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by the delightful Anna Parker, who is the Senior Broker and Head of Auckland at Frank Chris Management. Welcome, Anna. Lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. Yeah, good morning. And it's really lovely to be here. Yeah. Hey, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We're going to be talking about insurance today. And I know for most of you probably thinking, oh my goodness, do I really want to listen to this? That's a grudge purchase. It's not something I'm really interested in. But I have to just share with you that Anna and I met through a mutual friend who said we should catch up. We we went for a walk and a talk and she shared with me her story and I just thought this is somebody I need to get on the podcast and share what she has learned over her years. So um, we're not going to start with the story. They were actually going to ask Anna, first of all, like we always do, what's your professional and personal best, Anna, that you can share with the listeners? My professional best was setting up the Auckland office of Frank Risk Management around about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And I did that with a 10 month old and it was quite a big call. I mean, you'll find out later that my story is I left law. So I left law, joined a larger um, American owned broking house, then wasn't sure if broking was actually for me, went to approach the uh, founders of Frank Risk to say, actually, what you're doing is fantastic. You're a disruptor in the industry. I really like everything about you. Please, could I set up an Auckland office? They thought that was a wonderful idea. And here we are a year and a half later, and it's been a fantastic year. So um, yeah, that was definitely a professional um, best for me. Sounds fantastic. Yeah. In terms of a personal best, um, I, I know that uh, everyone's going to say this, but it is true. So my two and a half year old, I have a two and a half year old girl. And that's definitely a professional, a, a personal best yeah. because she's just so bold, sassy. She's really determined. She always talks back to me, which I love. <laughs> Strong willed. She puts me in my place. Um, the other day I, I did her hair. She, she often doesn't let me do her hair. And I did her hair, put it on top of her head. And she touched it and said, no, no, mommy, that's wrong. I want hair like Elsa. Elsa has hair that wraps around her neck. Two and a half telling me how she wants <laughs> her hair. So, I mean, get you know, so I'm doing her hair. And she said, mommy, I believe you can do it. Like, try again, have another go. And she's coaching Aww. me through how to do her hair, which I, I, I really love. And then she asked me at the end, how do you feel? You did it. And I said, I feel really proud, Rose. That I nailed the hairstyle that you want. <laughs> So that that is so intrinsic motivation. So that was another <laughs> proud moment. <laughs> that is so awesome. It sounds like she may pick up some characteristics from her mum there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we, I, we're going to talk about your story now because this is really important. So, you know, you're, yes, you're working with Frank Risk Management right now, who's got a team of 40-odd staff, but that's not where you started, right? Um, no. Your life was very, very different a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So you might have picked up an accent already. I'm from England and I was born in Southampton. I moved over here about 15 years ago. And at which point I, for many years, was an insurance litigation lawyer and what that, what that means is that the law firm that I worked for was an appointed by insurers as a panel law firm to act on claims that were really complex or difficult. So insurers have their own in-house claims team. And when anything gets difficult, high value, complex, or they just need an external legal counsel, then it gets farmed out to external lawyers. And I was one of those panel law firms. So I acted on a variety of claims across all insurance policies um, in, in, in defense litigation. Wow. And I did that for a number of years. And part of what I was discovering was that um, it's amazing when your insurance policy responds and you pay all this money for premiums and you think, right, well, something's happened. I've ha I have a claim against me. Um, I need my insurance policy to respond, to pay for the compensation, to pay for legal fees. And most of the time that was the case and it was, you know, it worked really well, but sometimes business owners hadn't really thought about what their business activities were or exclusions on policies or was the actual policy going to be triggered by this particular claim circumstance. So part of my role was to explain to um, different people that their policies weren't going to respond in the way that they thought and mm. after doing that quite a few times over the years I thought I wonder if there's a better way a better way to be of service a better way to use this knowledge and skills and actually help people at the beginning stages or during when they don't have a claim rather than just in a claim experience when there's nothing I can really do to help them because it's going to be a decline on their insurance policy mm. so I decided to leave law and go into 
working. <laughs> and that must be a huge step to make because we all know that lawyers are very well paid. And yeah, um, yeah I mean, I'm not, not denying that it's huge amounts of work, but um, yeah. still to take that sort of jump from there to insurance broking was massive, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely huge. And also because I had, um, in New Zealand, they don't necessarily recognise your English law degree. So I had done law at um, in England, come over here and thought, oh, I'll just be a lawyer here. Then I had to go back to university again. So I ended up with two law degrees. So to turn your back on, to turn your back on all of that and say, actually, I just kind of want to help. And there's just, it just it's just how you feel. And I just mm-hmm. felt like, there, are, there were many insurance lawyers out there, but there weren't too many who had actually said, I'm going to leave insurance law and I'm going to use all of that and help businesses um, in a different capacity. So I felt really motivated by that. That was kind of like my, like my I will do this. this. I could make a difference here. Yeah. And um, yeah, so so far, those suspicions were proved right. It's, uh, it's going really well. I really enjoy it. <laughs> Excellent. And so what kind of insurance do you do in your current role? So what does Frank Risk Management actually do? Yeah, so it's, it's commercial, commercial mm-hmm. insurance. And that can range from your business assets to um, so big motor fleets or commercial property buildings to liability insurance. So my specialty is liability insurance and that is professional indemnity, directors and officers, um, liability insurance that covers you for all legal liability you owe or you're accountable to to third parties. So there's a whole rough cyber insurance that also falls under the banner of liability. So yeah, anything commercial really. Fantastic. And I know that when we did our walk and talk, you gave me an example of a client that you worked with. But what really struck me was you have a different model of charging. Is that right? We do. Yeah. We, we don't believe in commission. So tradition, the traditional broking model is that you place insurance with an insurer and that insurer pays you commission, a percentage. And in New Zealand, it can vary from 15 to 30% plus there are kickback arrangements, profit shares. So an insurer will say, hey, um, I will give, yeah, there's all these different models out there that mean that if you put a lot of business with one particular insurance company, you will get a lot of kickbacks and things coming, you know, coming your way back to you as a broker. Mm -hmm. And that was a model that I hadn't really appreciated as a lawyer. And I discovered once I became a broker and it was more about how it, at the time, certainly, I think the rules have changed a little bit now, but at the time, it wasn't disclosed on your premium bill. So you would get a bill for $100,000 mm-hmm. and you think, oh, right, that's the cost of my insurance. That's really expensive. But it wasn't broken down to say your insurance cost $70,000 and the broker's commission is $30,000. It wasn't explained like that. And also... It's not, it's not really about the money you pay. It's the value you get. Like how, how much value do I think I'm getting from my insurance and from my insurance broker and the person who's advising me around insurance? Do I feel like this is really, you know, I'm really looked after. I'm getting really solid advice. Is that sort of commission worth it? Mm. And when you flip it on its head and you say, we will operate on a transparent way. So we will provide our services and at an hourly rate like a lawyer would charge or fixed fee or, or, or however it is suddenly you the the clients will think to themselves oh this is so clear I really appreciate someone showing me exactly like the cost of what your insurance is and then what I'm paying someone to give me advice around around all of it and yeah it's uh, it's quite a game changer and another really important point about commission is that when you're paid buy an insurance company to me it seems like quite a large conflict so you come to me and say hey will you give me some insurance advice place my insurance go to the market get all these different terms back but ultimately you're not paying you're not paying for my services the insurer is paying for my services so Mm. to me conflict 101 whereas at frank the company i work for it's completely separate so a bill for insurance and then we are paid separately by the client. So we act for the client, all their interests are put first. Yeah. 
And so, as you said, it can be a fixed fee or it can be an hourly yeah. rate. And but and so yeah. you're not you're not saying that um, insurance brokers shouldn't be paid for the value that they add. Right. Absolutely the opposite. Yeah. You're saying that actually they should be paid based on the value that they actually add. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. And so, tell me about the kinds of insurance that business owners should be thinking of, and also if they're going to go to a broker, what should they have already thought of before they come to you? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of aspects there that. Gen, I mean, the, your basic insurance policies that kind of if, you, if a startup came to me and said, oh, I'm, I'm just getting into business, what sort of policy should I look at? You have mm-hmm. to split it into two camps. So you've got your physical assets, what's tangible? Do you own any buildings? Do you own any stock? Do you have any office equipment? What can you physically touch and what's, what's tangible? And yeah. also the liability. So what, what things could go wrong? So what's, what's worst case scenario where things could go wrong that you can transfer some of that risk to an insurer? So when you think about physical assets, you have your material damage, so you're insuring the stock, the, the office furniture, whatever it is, so material damage. And then you can also have business um, interruption, which would provide financial assistance in the event of a material damage loss. Um, and then also your commercial motor, And then when you go into the liability area, some of the the policies would be general liability, which covers property damage and personal injury to third parties. So such as a tradesman might accidentally fracture a water pipe, Mm. causing some damage. Professional indemnity is also a big one. So if you're a um, if you if your business offers services or advice to people and that that third party suffers a financial loss because of something you said or some of the advice you gave then a professional indemnity policy would pay for those defense costs and any compensation to that third party Mm -hmm. and then another one that people don't really think about especially in the startup stages is directors and officers insurance and it's also known as dno and that's designed to provide financial compensation to help directors and officers against allegations of mismanagement mismanagement while they carry out their duties and their day-to-day management of uh, governance of the company. Hmm. Okay, so that's if you're starting up. What if you're an established business? Let's just say you have a lot of that cover. Yes, when would you yes. consider reviewing it? How often should you review it? Why should you review it? What will you do in that situation? Yeah, so bare minimum is a every year to review, to sit back and say, has my business changed? Have the activities changed? What am I doing? Um, otherwise, I would I would also recommend every six months, really, to say, like, what, what's going on? Is there is there insurance out there? that has come onto the market or something I haven't really considered. So cyber insurance would be a big one at the moment. A lot of, a lot of people and um, business owners that come to me don't really have or haven't thought about cyber insurance. And there's two aspects to that, which is whether you need cyber insurance or whether you need to kind of put more risk mitigation practices into how you protect um, from cyber criminals and all those sorts of things. So that's kind of twofold, but yes, yeah, it's, it's really looking at it and thinking, I know, like like we talked about earlier, that insurance is a grudge purchase, but paying a lot of attention to it and thinking, is this what I'm doing? Is my business still in the same? You know, have I changed staff activities? Like, what's different about my world that someone should come and look at? And and also um, claims, like if you have an insurance claim, so to think, to kind of analyze after the insurance claim and say, oh, what what worked well. Mm. my my insurance paid out or the insurance didn't pay out and what could what could have been done differently do I need to pay attention here or are there risk mitigation practices that we need to start looking at yep and I think I think especially in current times with all the changes that are going on around the world with COVID kind of prompting some of them but even so it's changed the whole way that we work it's probably a good time to actually go am I doing the same as what I was doing six months 12 months ago or have things changed significantly yeah and therefore yeah. a chance to review it yeah yeah exactly exactly and also looking at your insurance policy the documents itself and look and getting the documents out. And I'm not saying reading the whole policy wording. Oh I'm saying I'm saying grabbing the insurance schedule and yep. looking at it and thinking, <clears throat> what does that exclusion mean? So mm. your policy schedule will also contain exclusions, endorsements. What what do they actually mean? <clears throat> Picking up the phone or going and having a meeting with your broker to say, I've seen all these things on the policy. Can you explain them? Can you put it into terms I'm going to understand what that means? Because Often, I mean, we saw 
quite recently, an exclusion on a policy, an accountant's policy, um, a tax mitigation warranty on an accountant's professional indemnity uh, liability policy. This had the effect of excluding all cover under the policy for tax related advice. That's exactly what accountants do. do. So, yeah. so uh, their professional indemnity policy had all the cover stripped out of it. And the accountants truly had no idea that this exclusion sat on their policy. Uh, we rectified that and, and sorted it out. But they just, they just hadn't paid attention mm. to those to what those exclusions actually meant. And I think, and I'm going to say this because I used to work in insurance myself, as you know, and I think there is an element of insurance companies do make it difficult for you to fully understand the, the way, you know, the way the policies are worded. And that's not, you know, that's just the way that they operate. I get that. But yeah. I think that it's important, as you said, to pay attention. If you don't understand it, at least have somebody else go through it with you and explain it to you to make sure you actually understand what you're covered for. Because the worst time is that claim time when it's too late, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> so, so let's talk about some of the common mistakes that you've seen made with people in insurance. Yeah, I mean, look, it really is <clears throat> the business activities. So to look at your schedule and it will be called business description, business activities. Um, let's talk about a, a builder again. So that builder might do a bit of building work, um, some roofing, some drainage alongside all of their standard building work. But the insurance policy might just say building building construction building work it won't actually specifically list out roofing and drainage work if that's not on the schedule if that's not listed out as a business activity then the insurers are unlikely to help out if a claim came in from a homeowner for example about the roofing work that the builder did so to, that's a that's a common error and people mm. don't really pay attention to that so that's something i would definitely um, yeah, look out for. That's a big sure. one. And what about, so I work with a lot of professional services and family businesses. Um, now, they are a mixture of product and service professionals, but just in terms of, is there anything specific that you should be thinking of, particularly when it's a family business and you've got a whole bunch of the family involved in the business? Is there anything specific they should be looking at in terms of insurance? Um, I mean, making sure that the suite and the structure is set up. Mm. Um I think I think it's kind of hard to to know until like often also, yeah. often often clients will come to me and say here's here's my current insurance world here's what I have will yeah. you go through everything and we'll go through all the fine tooth comb and check over everything and when you kind of look at the whole picture together um, that's important and get get a second opinion I mean people will often say that about doctors. Uh, if, or and lawyers even. So if you go near a doctor or a lawyer and you're not happy with the advice you're getting, you'll happily go to get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same about your broker. If you think, oh, am I getting the right advice? Is, there, is someone putting a lot of care and attention into my insurance? Um, get a second opinion. Definitely oh. get someone else to review it and, and make sure that the structure and you, you, you transferred all of your risk and you've got the right policies. And are you over-insured? Are mm. you under-insured? Like, you know, cause yes. people will spend a lot of money on insurance, but is this the right insurance for your business? Is this what you need? Yeah. And what do you think makes a good broker? Cause I mean, obviously there's lots of brokers out there and, and I'm sure some really great ones out there, but yeah. what in your opinion makes a good broker? What should I be looking for if I'm looking for, you know, to change, for example? Yeah, definitely knowledge and experience in the industry. Um, and one, a really persistent broker, someone who isn't <laughs> going to um, just hit, say, oh, that's a really hard risk. I can't find you insurance for that. So that's mm -hmm. happened quite a few times. Um, a recent example was there was a startup company who came to us and they were importing restricted veterinary medicine and they were trying to get a contract with New Zealand's largest leading poultry producer. It mm -hmm. really was the opportunity of a lifetime for this startup company to have a contract with such a large corporate. It was a big deal for them. They couldn't get insurance because no underwriters um, wanted to offer terms because they deemed this risk was too significant for the small startup when dealing with a large corporate. And as a result, they came to us because their company was about to go out of business because they couldn't sign this contract. 
and they, they couldn't get insurance. Um, and the ones that were going to offer insurance were going to put what's called a total product efficacy exclusion on the policy. I'm not going to go too insurance geek on you. I'm not going to delve into that, but just like it was a bad insurance policy. So insurance, the insurers who were out there were saying, I will give you this insurance, but for what you actually need it for, I'm going to strip away a lot of the cover like we talked about earlier. So yeah. it, it was a matter of... Um, a lot of other brokers have said to this client, we can't get you terms. We're not going to help you kind of on your own. Actually, how can you work with that client to change their risk profile? Are there ways of putting them in touch with lawyers, for example, to get the right compliance documents, their risk profile looking better? So we worked alongside that. So it wasn't a case of um, hearing no from all the market. It was actually like, how can you repurpose and rejig the risk to make it look better to the underwriters. So we worked with them. And I mean, that was an incredible result for this business mm. who had been told no to suddenly be able to sign that contract. Their business has since, since flourished and it's extraordinary to witness. So I think if you were a business owner out there and you heard a broker saying, no, that's a really difficult risk. No, I can't find options. Well then ask around and mm. actually say, um, either you know, to your broker, please, can you make sure you go to all the markets, global, local, or just see who else is out there who's got a bit more um, of persistence behind yeah, Sure. And I suppose that also comes at the other end of the thing when it's claim time as well, right? You want oh, somebody yes, to go in and so fight important. for you. Yep. So important. You really want a broker who is going to hold your hand and be your advocate uh, for you and really understand the nuances of the policy and how the policy is triggered when a claim comes in and what needs to happen and working alongside not only lawyers, loss adjusters, helping you collect evidence if necessary, working through the story and the scenario and helping you with the chronology, just really someone who's working alongside you for all of that. Claims time is such a critical and important moment for someone you really, really need an advocate alongside you in that moment. And you're probably going to hate me for saying this, but I'm just thinking back to our original conversation about, you know, when brokers are paid commission by the companies, that's part of the conflict, isn't it? Because when it comes to claims time, um, there must be something in there that, that if they, that, or who do they who do they actually work for, I suppose, is the question I would ask. Not going to ask you to answer that, but that's what's going through my mind is actually, if they're being paid these big commissions by the insurance companies, um, are they going to fight for your really small claim when they've got this great big book full of insurance with the people who pay them? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What? Um. Any other sort of common mistakes that we should look out for in terms of, um, you know, when you're working through your insurance policies? Uh, the limits of indemnity. So that could be a, a million dollars, two million dollars, five million. So often, clients will be asked to enter into a contract, and mm-hmm. that contract will say we require you to hold a million dollars of general liability and so they will look at the contract and either just think to themselves actually I had I had one the other day where someone had asked this very small company to hold 50 million (laughs) dollars and it was such an outrageous sum for such a small job and I I don't even think the fee was very high for this client client of what they said and they they called me up and said you know can you help me find 50 million dollars of professional indemnity insurance and I said well first of all what's the what's the what's this contract what's the Mm. contract value and have you tried to push back on this have you said that is an outrageously high amount <laughs> that that will cost way more than the entire cost of the project of what you want me to do? Yeah. Um, you know, where can we go with that? And they hadn't even crossed their mind that they could push back on a contract and what's in a contract. So common mistakes are looking at what the contract says mm-hmm. and can you push back on it? And also, do you need a lawyer's advice on this? Like, are you just signing a contract because you think, oh, 
uh, some massive company has given you a contract, I should sign it because I want the work and I want the business. Or actually, mm. should you just spend a little bit of money to get it reviewed by a lawyer who will talk you through a lot of these issues? Yeah, that Definitely. makes perfect sense. Yeah, it is interesting because I think often that happens, particularly with the sort of small, medium sized businesses working with large corporates, they come with kind of a standard contract, but that does not mean that it's set in stone. Yeah. That is, it's almost like that's the starting point for negotiation, right? Completely. <laughs> yeah. Completely, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, we're coming to the end of the podcast. It's amazing how time flies, even when talking about insurance. Can you believe that? <laughs> so a couple of things that I'd like to ask. I always ask uh, um, our guests to talk about you know, their two, top three tips that they would actually share. And for you, I'd love a little bit of both because obviously you're running, um, you're, you're set up and running the, the Auckland branch of a very successful business, but also your insurance broker. So what were your top three tips from a personal perspective, from a business perspective? Sure. Definitely goes back to the uh, what we talked about earlier, which yep. was really pay attention to your insurance policy. Um, even if it's just a bit dull and a bit boring, just please just get those documents out, cast your eye over the schedules, look at it and think, does that reflect what I want? Are the limits what I actually want? Mm-hmm. It, do I have the insurance I need for the risks that my business has? And are the business activities adequately explained in the schedule? So really get those documents out and have a look through and work alongside your broker and ask questions. Be curious about insurance of like, what does this exclusion mean? Am I covered if this scenario happened? Work through your worst case scenario and think, uh, if this happened to me, am am I covered? Um, Have I transferred my risk appropriately to an insurance company? And work with your broker alongside that. Mm. Um, The next one would be in all aspects of life, I would say, be really persistent and, 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 and don't give up. I mean, you know, you hear, I'll hear a no, and I might think to myself, "Oh, not yet. That's a not yet. Maybe next year." <laughs> so yeah, be be persistent. And the actually, other I, yeah, just on the button that I was actually at a presentation last night with Bill James, and he was sort of saying, you know, as Kiwis, we tend to very much take one no as meaning no, and he said you should at least get to the second no before you yeah. kind of give up because the first no is just a it's a brush off. It's easy. Um, yeah. So you ask the question, so why do you feel that way, and what can I, you know, is there anything I can do to change your mind? And it's yeah. only when you get the second no that you can go, okay, maybe I should give up now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, that, and that leads into be curious. So mm. be curious about where, where has that no come from? Is, are, are there ways that you could improve? Um, often I will say to other you know, people around me that a, a client or someone you want to work with will say, oh, no, I'm, no, I'm not interested. Mm. And they'll just say, oh, no worries. Like speak to you next year or something. Whereas actually you want to know why, like what are the hurdles that stand in the way of us working together? Like mm. what, what are those reasons? So I always want to push a bit further and say, um, can you explain why that is or what, what stands in the way of us working together or what are those reasons or what can I work on or what can we all work on and things like that? Like how can you improve processes, systems, service, all, all of those sorts of questions that like be really curious and want to know reasons why someone says what they say perfect and then the um another one would be uh, be bold just walk into the room and know your worth know your value be confident um yeah and that goes on both sides, right? It's like at the end of the day, um, we're working together. So yeah. let's embrace and appreciate uh, the value that each brings to the relationship and, and work together for the better the yeah. Greater good. Yeah. How could it be a win for you and a win for me? Yeah. Yeah. Love it. How can we, how can we both be happy in this scenario? Yeah. Hey, look, um, as I said, unfortunately, we are running out of time, but I guess if people want to talk to you, I mean, I'm sure they get huge value out of talking to you. Um, how would they actually get hold of you? What's the best way to do that? And do you, for new clients, how does that work? Yeah, so you can go to, I think you've, you've got a link to um, my bio and it has on our website and it has all yep. the contact details and you can reach out to me. I'm also on LinkedIn, so you can send me a message there. All my contact details should be easily found on LinkedIn or mm-hmm. on the, um, our website and new businesses just just reach out and we have an initial discovery meeting where mm-hmm. I learn more about you and I learn more about your business and what what's the right insurance out there for you and we work through all of this. Yeah, fantastic. I can see you're really passionate about what you do. I guess there's no chance you're going back to being a lawyer, is there? No, no. <laughs> hey, Anna, look, thank you so much for making the time this morning. I know that you've kind of got your, your daughter off to school and come in and, and got ready for this podcast. So thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Look forward to talking again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.